Hey, what's up, Scott Balkan here with Imagination Creation Films, and today we're tackling part two of our data storage series for filmmakers. Buckle up, we're gonna be taking a bigger bite this time. So this is part two of a multi-part series, so please try not to skip over everything. If you haven't watched part one, there's a link in the description, you really should. It's well worth your time, and it'll keep you from asking questions later. And also, now's a great time to subscribe and click the alert bell so you don't miss a thing like the next episode. So now we've learned about the various levels of RAID, and this video is about the parts that can affect performance in both delivery and storage itself outside of RAID. And as they say, the devil is in the details. And well, I meant that when it comes to buying storage and navigating the massive vagueness that manufacturers go through to make their products look better than they technically are. A quick note, many years ago, hard drive manufacturers decided that they could market their drives as larger if they played around in a gray area a bit. So in computers, eight bits equals one byte. And confusion immediately sets in uh, with the naming scheme because we're using the metric system for naming in computers like one kilobyte. But in the metric system, it's built on decimals and a base 10 math. A computer is binary and it's built on base two math. All right, so this part's gonna get a little wild, so follow as best you can. One kilobyte is not a thousand bytes as you'd expect in the metric system, but it's actually a thousand and twenty-four bytes. One megabyte is following the base two is 1,024 kilobytes, but that doesn't equal 1,024,000 bytes. It's actually 1,048,576 bytes. And one gig is 1,024 megabytes, etc. Back in the late 90s, the drive manufacturers changed reality and started using base 10 or 1,000 instead of 1024 in every step of their math to sell the hard drives as larger than it actually was. It was a cost savings or a profit boosting measure. And it wasn't just a small change. It ends up equaling about 6.9% of your storage space. Now the IEC came up with a new definition of Gibby bytes and Tibby bytes, and that's what computers use. But the drive manufacturers promptly ignored using the new name since it would make their drives look smaller again. So they just kept doing what they've been doing, using base 10 math for base two system so they could sell a smaller drive as a larger drive. So what that means is a 10 terabyte advertised drive is actually only 9.3 terabytes an actual capacity. Now these are the little things that drive manufacturers do to mislead us as to what we're actually getting. Similarly, in performance metrics, hard drives and even SSDs will quote the theoretical maximum speed of the connection type that they use versus the actual usable speed. For instance, a hard drive could be advertised with a maximum speed of six gigabits per second, which is the SATA 3 standard maximum throughput. And that would translate to 600 megabytes per second maximum. Now, you might, if you've been following along here, you might do that math and say, wait, Scott, um, that should be 750 megabytes per second. And you'd be right in some cases. But in the case of SATA, PCIe, USB, NVMe, they all use 10 bits of data to deliver eight bits safely. And so you divide by 10 instead of eight. It's almost like they want us to use decimals, isn't it? But they'll advertise it as 600 megabytes per second maximum. And that'd be wonderful, except it's only possible if the data you were requesting was in the K 
cache, the memory cache of the physical spinning hard drive. And that cache itself was capable of delivering at the speed of SATA. And to make it seem even less awesome, cache on hard drives is measured in megabytes, not gigabytes. So a 10 terabyte drive may only have between 64 and 256 megabytes of cache. It's not a lot of data and it's very likely in our world, your data is not gonna sit in that cache. So the max speed of your drive is actually what the heads and the platters can deliver. And sadly, this too is variable. A good rule of thumb for current large spinning drives is that you're gonna get a maximum speed of about 200 megabytes per second out of a single drive when it's completely empty. And it'll slow down to just about half of that as it fills up. It's just the nature of the beast. We could dive into that if you guys want on drive technologies, but that's the way it is. So now let's talk about hard drive writing technology and well, how it could cost you big time down the road if you choose incorrectly. The only way to explain this is to show it and Domino's is pretty much the easiest way. Not a very good pizza, but a great explanation of bits. So when you write a bit to a hard drive, it writes this to a magnetic particle and that particle is vertical. This particle is charged so that either north or south, because it's a magnetic particle, is pointed up. And that indicates odd or even, or one or zero. These are placed as densely as they can next to each other. However, they aren't touching each other. There has to be a gap between them or one particle will affect the next particle, etc. This is called CMR or conventional magnetic recording. Now, think about what happens when you try to put two magnets together where north is aligned, they're gonna oppose each other. Or in the case of hard drives, they'll change each other and your data would become invalid. So a gap must exist. Well, the drive manufacturers figured out they could once again play with the system and they could get more particles in the same area if they allowed them to overlap a little bit. This is called SMR or shingled magnetic recording. Think of it like shingles on a roof. This might seem well like a good design, but the devil's in the details. Just like on a shingled roof, if you need to replace a few shingles or bits of data, you have to pull up far more shingles or bits of data than the ones you need to replace. So on an SMR hard drive, if you rewrite data to an area that already has data written, you must pick up the old data and then rewrite the old data with the new data. Now, this can significantly slow down drive performance on writes because it must read a large chunk and then rewrite a large chunk just for a small amount of data. In the case of RAID, well, this can seriously compound and bring your speeds to a crawl. All of this to save a few dollars and market their drives as larger. So in almost every case, you only want CMR drives. And it was only recently that drive manufacturers decided through a massive public outcry that they would probably disclose the technology used. Remember, CMR, that's the one to remember. So now let's talk about the speed and flexibility of accessing the large amounts of data we need to store as video professionals. There are several connection standards for data transfer, and I'll break them down for you and kind of discuss the pros and cons of each. Well, first we have USB. USB is likely the easiest to connect, and it's the worst performing of the group. Even though it's been adapted and upgraded over the years, it just wasn't meant for high-speed storage traffic. So I would strongly urge you to not consider it 
except on single individual drive basis. Next, we have Thunderbolt. Now, Thunderbolt was designed for high-speed storage traffic in mind, so it's a great option when you just need to connect a single computer to a large amount of storage. Now, there are a handful of options that allow multiple connections to Thunderbolt storage as well. It takes a little work to get the multiple users working off of it, but it is possible. The next option we have is Ethernet. And this comes with a few speeds. And although it wasn't designed for high-speed storage traffic, there are a number of protocols that have been designed to work with it and make it efficient with storage. Now, it can take a little work to get it working, but it's the most flexible and expandable for sharing storage. And honestly, locating storage in more favorable places in your office studios, etc. Now, there's another option, and that is internal RAID for those with PCs, well, and, and certain rare instances of Mac Pros. This requires a card, a physical hardware card designed for RAID, and multiple drives that are installed inside your PC or directly connected externally. Now, it takes a bit of work to configure those, and it's even more work to share it with others but it can be quite fast. And you'll need to use a solution above any of those to connect multiple computers, except the USB. So now let's dig a little deeper into each of the most viable options. The first one is Thunderbolt. And for Thunderbolt storage, I would highly recommend the brand Arica. I've been using their arrays for many years, many, 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 many years. And quite frankly, I don't have issues with them. QNAP also makes a couple that support Thunderbolt, but I personally don't have the highest confidence in QNAP at the moment due to their security vulnerabilities previously that allowed ransomware into people's storage and other compromises. Not once, not twice, but three times <laughs> now i know they've since resolved that issue but it's going to take a while for the trust to come back well for me at least but they're another option now looking at these two options i would strongly recommend at least an eight bay unit and preferably a 12 bay now one of the reasons that i recommend these two brands one must mostly over the other they are hardware RAID internally, meaning the box has its own hardware controller and just gives you a Thunderbolt connection. And that makes life a lot easier in some respects. As I was saying, I would recommend at least an eight bay unit, but preferably a 12 bay. And the main reason it's easier to expand than to replace drives. Uh, with the Eureka, you could install eight drives on a 12 bay, and then later add one more at a time until you're completely full with the 12 drives. But then you can replace the drives one at a time for a larger drive. So you just pull out, say, a 10 terabyte, slap it a 20, tell it to rebuild, and it rebuilds with 20. And then when you replace all of those drives, you can then expand out using your new storage capacity. Running the uh, larger arrays also allows you to run a better RAID for your needs and still have that performance that you require. Now, if you need to share that data with another computer, well, you'll need to share the drive from your computer over an ethernet network. Now, this can be slow if you don't have at least a 10 gig ethernet. The negative is that editing programs tend to tie video clips to paths that the drive is mapped to. So if you're local and your drive is called data, then if another editor is connected to your machine with the same data, their drive won't be called data. It's gonna be called whatever your machine name is slash data or an IP address slash data or something else. And so the editing software is going to be looking for slash data slash file name. And on the other editor, they're gonna be not having a, a mapped drive named data. It's gonna be 
your machine name slash data. And so the software is gonna say, I don't know where anything is, and you'll have to relink it. Okay, you could do that. As soon as this person with the original drive goes back into that project, you have to relink it again. That becomes kind of a pain in the rear. Um, so let's talk about Ethernet and NAS. So the most expandable connection option, as mentioned above, is Ethernet to connect to a NAS. Now, what's a NAS? NAS is a network attached storage. It's a storage array, and it's almost always with RAID, that can share its data using just an ethernet connection, using many different protocols. Now, the easiest protocol is SMB for sharing for Windows and for Macs and, and even Linux. Um, and if you're sharing, for any kind of speed, you're gonna to want to use at least a 10 gig ethernet to achieve these speeds. A 10 gig ethernet network, it can, it can transfer data at up to 1250 megabytes a second or 1.25 gigabytes per second. It can do that over simple copper wires. But the truth is, is you're likely gonna max out about 1100, 1150 megabytes a second simply because ethernet performs slightly less when it, reach, when it reaches full capacity. And this is called saturation. It's just a thing. Ethernet connection speeds can actually get over 100 gigabits per second. And it's possible, but you're using fiber uh, and everything may be cost prohibitive at that point. So 10 gig ethernet, well, it used to be expensive, but it has finally come way down in cost. For, well, very small networks, you don't even need a network switch. You can connect a computer to another computer directly, or you can connect two computers to a NAS that has dual 10 gig ports. If your one machine has dual ethernet ports in there and you have two other editors, they could connect to you without the need of a switch. Now we'll break down those, down those connection examples in the individual configuration videos for the various storage options. So don't worry, we'll get back to them. Now, one of my favorite NAS devices is Synology and they offer a variety of expandable NAS servers. You just need to make sure that you get one that has either built in 10 gig ethernet or has an expansion slot so that you can add one. QNAP also offers these NAS servers as well, and well, you've heard my opinion on them currently, but again, it's just my opinion. I really kind of want to do kind of like a, a NAS shootout, but I need Synology and um, QNAP to, to, well, send me some evaluation units to do that uh, so I can get the latest data to all of you. Um, the benefit to NAS is, 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 is everyone would be connecting to the same share name. So files wouldn't have to be relinked to all of your different editors. And that can be a time saver. Now, this concludes part two of the series. In the next few parts of the series, we'll be deep diving into the individual storage solutions. I'll show you how to set them up, how to configure them, et cetera. I'll show you the network switches, the connections, all of that, so that you can figure out which one's best for you and make it happen. And if you have any questions about the connection types or anything that we discussed, please drop a comment and I'll try to answer them. Now we'll be diving much, much deeper in the next few videos. So if your question isn't about RAID type for the first video, or connection types in this video, it'll likely be answered in the next video. But if it is related to it, drop it down below. I'll try to respond to them and, and give you the best answer I can. If you'd like to support this channel for this series or all everything else I'm doing, uh, please consider purchasing any of this gear using an affiliate link down below. It really helps the channel. Also, consider subscribing and joining the channel membership. It's another great way to help support the channel and be a part of the community. And as always, as I like to leave it, 
Don't let your passions center around your life. Let your life center around your passions. Mm-hmm.